I share a birthday with Justin Bieber, if that helps. So, yeah, I, 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 a lot of my uh, my frat brothers, they never let me let that down. So. <laughs> I feel so sorry for you. And and, and uh, what what's her name? Um, uh, uh, what's her name? Kesha. I share a birthday with her. It's actually the same day in the same year. Um, it's like literally the same day with her. But that's it. That's all I've got. So, all right. Let me make this slideshow bigger. So, um, okay. All right. So, hopefully you all viewed the video on Teams from yesterday. The exams are graded. Uh, uh by and large, everybody did well on the exam, except for the last problem. And, I, and I, I'm going to chalk it up, like I said in the video, I'm going to chalk it up to just time. And and I, I honestly think just with the weather and the weird schedules that we had, that it, everybody was still sort of getting caught up with things. And I imagine that, you know, I mean, I had my exam, but if I was a betting man, there's other faculty that had theirs too. And and you might have had just a, a, a tough week. So um, so I was like, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, give you an opportunity to correct that one problem. because, And it was really, it was that problem. So um, that is... Um, uh, I, what? Hold on. It, I, what I usually do, I mean, there were people that had put something down, had done some work. So um, so first off, uh, to, to answer Mr. Schmierczynski's comment, um, even if you didn't arrive at a final answer for a given problem, I always try and take a look at what you've done for a given problem and try and see how close you were and try and assign a point value. So if it's like a 20 point problem, I might look at the problem and go, okay, they didn't finish, but they were about halfway there. So I'll take off minus 10 or something like that. Um, I, I try and be fair. Um, so the way I, I've always squared that is I don't curve. That's that's the other side of things. It's like you get what you get. Um, but I always, I always try and, and um, defer and give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, so those corrections are due Friday at 11. I saw, I guess there's a, a typo on Blackboard where I put noon. I'm going to fix that because they are due at 11 because I want them turned in before class on Friday. And there are no late submissions on that. They're due at 11. Um, and you can earn up to 10 points, and that just depends on how much was deducted for problem eight. For the, if you, the long story short, if you didn't have much deducted off problem eight, then you probably didn't need the corrections anyways because you that those students did, did very well. But you can earn up to 10 points uh, on um, on the correction there. And if you don't want to do the corrections, you don't have to. Um, that it's totally voluntary. So there's no penalty for, for not doing them. And uh, and there you go. So uh, also, you but we are still trucking with the class. So you are getting homework 3.2 today. And it's also going to be due Friday. So um, that, that's, that's the, the balancing act because we still got to keep on trucking. Um, okay, uh, 3.1 was due today. Uh, we'll try and get that graded and uh, back to you tomorrow or Friday, somewhere in that time frame, so we can get back to our, you know, regularly scheduled broadcasting. Uh, we are in bolted connection land. Um, we're going to do another analysis example today. This one's going to feel very similar to the one that we did on um, on Wednesday, but it's a tad more involved because where it's um, it, not only is it a double shear situation, but it's also um, sort of a portion of a spliced connection. And I found that of all the different types of connections that we could deal with, the splice tends to, uh, students tend to think of the splice when they first see it as a little bit like a riddle, like they don't know how many bolts to consider and what cases to consider. So I want to focus on the splice a little bit today. Um, I'm also going to tie a little bit of what you did on the homework and what we did last time to the real world. Uh, and, you, and I have a little bit of an example that should hit close to home because I imagine most of you have seen this example or at least passed by it. Um, and then we'll get into splice and talk about double shear. Okay, so um, let's just go back to, you know, recalling what we need to, to you know, the fundamentals that we need to assess uh, a bolted connection. 
Uh, and so specifically, we're, talk we're still talking about bearing type connections. Slip critical connections, which we're going to talk about near the end, are the same. There's just another limit. There's a bolt shear, bolt bearing, and bolt slip limit. And you end up treating bolt slip very much like you treat uh, a bolt shear. And in design land, we just take the smallest of the two for, for design. So it, it's really, it's it's sort of like um, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, um, uh, 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 conceptual information that goes along with it, but in terms of the math and actually a design, uh, it's not much different. So if you understand a bearing type problem, a slip critical design really isn't all that different. Um, so bolt shear, uh, you, you all know the parameters that go into affecting bolt shear. We've got, you know, what group bolt, uh, the bolts are, um, what are the thread condition, the loading condition, you know, is it single shear, double shear, um, what's the bolt diameter. And so you can look up the capacity pretty easily. Um, for bolt bearing, um, you know, it's a little bit more involved, but it's hopefully it, it, it feels very rote and very just plug and chug. You know, you compute your LCE, compute your LCI, you know, with your whole diameter, uh, compute an RN for an edge bolt, compute an RN for an interior bolt, and then add up all your edge bolts, add up all your interior bolts, multiply it by 0.75, and boom, there's your capacity there. So it's not hard. It's just you just have to chug through it and do it. Um, what I want to talk about, uh, well, also, oh, I, I don't want to skip past the layout requirements. So remember, that was what we added on Monday. That was the new step. And so with layout requirements, there's bolt spacing limitations. So there's a minimum and a maximum as well as a preferred bolt spacing uh, 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 limit, uh, limits. And then there's edge distance requirements. And if we could lump... Um, uh, or if we could try and come up with two broad reasons for these layout requirements. One is to facilitate fabrication. And then the other is preventing corrosion. Let's get too close together then it's difficult to actually fabricate them. So maybe I'll put fabrication and construction here. You know, it's hard to get a wrench around bolts if they're too close together and they're knocking into one another. So we don't want, want bolts to get too close together. But if they get too far apart, then we might get water between the plate. And then water leads to corrosion. Corrosion is, is not a good thing for steel. Um, and, and as for, uh, and the same thing really applies for edge distance. If the edge distance is too far, you can get water seeping in. And if it's too small, then you, you, it, you can, it can result in poor workmanship. So we want, we want it to at least have uh, some minimum. Okay. Um, I want to just show you where some of the stuff, and this is a little bit on the side, but Considering that I cut a little bit of material out of bolted connections given the compressed schedule that we had because of the um, uh, the weather, I thought I would just take a little bit of time and talk about a real-life bolted connection just so we can try and tie what we've been doing to real life. And what I kind of want to focus on is this, okay? So does anybody recognize this? I hope. Somebody recognizes this. Is that the engineering lab? Yes, it is. This is the old building. Uh, uh, I say old building. I mean, it was completed in 2007, so it's not that old. Um, but what we have here is, so let's look at this a little you know, more globally. So yes, this is the old um, uh, engineering building. So this room right here, this is the 3D printing lab, You know where all the 3D printers are. Um, a little bit of historical trivia about Marshall. This guy named uh, Greg Michelson, when he started as a professor, his office was in that room. So, uh, you know, memories. Um, but um, what I want to focus on is, like, how would you go about as a structural engineer designing this connection? Okay. And so the first thing that you have to, con you know, look at when you're talking about design is what about the forces? What about the loads that are going to be on the connection? Well, this connection is all about connecting this beam to this column. So... First thing I want to do is I want to trace the load path, right? I want to, you know, and we talked about this at the end of structural analysis last semester. You know, if you have a load on a building, how does that load go from the floor to the beam, the beam to the column, the column to the ground, and it all goes into tributary area, right? And so maybe the first thing I'll do is, is if I'm looking at, you know, this beam, I might ask myself, okay, what is the, you know, tributary area 
of that floor beam, right? And so the roof of that, um, uh, the roof of that, uh, uh, you know, that's above that floor beam is going to have to support all the way to the roof. It's going to have to support, you know, any live load, you know, because usually roofs are going to have some degree of live load for if people go up there and then there's equipment and stuff like that up there. Obviously, uh, snow, you know, there's there's going to be environmental impacts up there as well. And so when it's all said and done, and we, we talked about this last semester, I can take this beam and I can turn it into, you know, something like this, right? And with that, I could then determine, you know, reaction shear moment, all that stuff. And I have got to believe that by now that it might have been a while since you've done it, but you understand it, right? Um, everybody okay with that? Okay, there, there we go. Good, good. That's what I like. Okay, so what I specifically want to focus on, and, and again, everything we're talking about here, I'm not, I'm, it's not like I'm, I'm, this isn't, I don't want you to get all worked up like, is this going to be on an exam? I just want you to learn something. This is all just about your, you know, development as an engineer. And so what I kind of want to focus on is the reaction, okay? Because if I'm talking about this floor beam right here, if, if, if I'm looking at this floor beam, where is that reaction going to go? Like, let's say the reaction is 30 kips. What Does that 30 kips just float out in space? No, ultimately it goes to the ground, okay? So 30 kips is going to go from that beam ultimately to the ground. So how does it get there? Well, the beam transmits load through the connection, right? So how does that work? Well, we've got... So what do we have here? Let, let's look at this... Uh, this column. So we've got a little column here, right? And we've got a little plate sticking out. Now I'm curious if you could tell from the uh, picture, do you think these bolts are going to be in single shear or are they going to be in double shear? It's kind of tough to see from the picture. I, I could appreciate. Let me, oh, let me see if I can, um, see if I can make that a little easier. How about a well, how about this? Before you, you answer that, let me do this. What if I did that? So I make it a little bigger. Yeah, no, it's fair. It's a, t uh, you know, I'm taking the picture from the ground, so it's it's a little fuzzy. You can kind of see those bolts are in single shear because there's only a single plate sticking out of the column, right? Does that make sense? All right. So, so there we go. So we have a, um, so we've got uh, this uh, column here. This column is uh, onto it, which, you know, there's a word right there that I'm throwing out, just this weld word. So one of the things we're going to have to do later is we're going to have to ask ourselves, what's the deal with this weld? I don't like, um, I don't like um, the, uh, the yellow there. I don't think that's easy to see. Let me use another color. Let's use uh, blue. So there's going to be a weld here. And so if I've got, I don't know, 30 kips. So maybe what I'll try and do is figure out maybe the weld can hold up five kips per inch and see how many inches of weld I need to support that load. That'll be something we talk about later. Um, but that's kind of the idea. So that'll tell us how many inches of weld we need, or it'll tell us if the connection has, I don't know, 10 inches of load or 10 inches of weld, is that enough weld to safely support that load, right? So if this is my, you know, factored load, I can compare that against the, the factored resistance, okay? But right now I'm more interested in talking about the bolts. So what I might say is, okay, I've got, you know, 30 kips on this connection, and so what's the deal? All right, well, I've got, what is it? One, two, three, four bolts. And so I might say, okay, what, what type of bolts are these? Are they A325 or are they A490? What's their bolt diameter? Um, threads included versus threads excluded. And so I can assess the bolt shear limit state pretty easily. Um, and I can determine, okay, maybe, you know, each bolt can withstand, I don't know, you know, 14 kips per bolt. 
And then I can basically say, well, if each bolt can hold up 14 kips, however much load is on the connection, divide, and that'll tell me how many bolts I need for the connection, right? And I'm just making numbers up. Don't don't take these numbers to the bank. But the idea is that that can tell me how many um, how many bolts I need for that connection. And then I can use the spacing limitations to figure out how far apart those bolts need to be from one another, how far apart those bolts need to be from the uh, from the edge, and then now I can do bolt bearing checks, right? So if I if I'm loading this thing in shear, you know I've got one edge bolt, three interior bolts, and so I can go through and compute the capacity. I'm just trying to take what we've been doing so far and tying it to a real life problem. Does it does this make sense? Anybody have any questions? Moving on. Yeah, I'm not like testing you on this. I don't want you to worry about tests. I just want you to soak in the knowledge. I have a question. Yes, sir. Is there typically uh, bolts and welded connections at joints like that? That is a great question. And the short answer is yes, uh, because what will happen is um, when this building was constructed, so that column, so let's take the round pipe, the round column. What happened was the fabricator, let's say it was Huntington Steel, and I actually think it might have been, um, but Huntington Steel will cut that column and weld, we call the a shear tab, weld that tab on the column at the fabrication shop. And then when it gets delivered to the uh, to the site, it's already got the tab there. So all they have to do is stand the column up, you know, erect the column, you know, connect it to the base plate or, you know, what have you. And then when the beams come in, all they have to do is bolt it. So the welding is done over at the shop. It's not done here, typically, okay? They might have a welder on site for some repair work that needs to be done, but by and large, they try and do most of the welding over at the shop. So that you, so you're right. That connection does have a combination of bolts and welds. Now, where the no-no comes into play, like what you don't do, is you have to uh, ensure. Like, let's think about this from hip bone to leg bone. So the load goes from the beam to the plate, and then from the plate to the column. Right, the plate, that little tab sticking out. That is the transfer mechanism, the, the transfer device that transfers the load from the beam to the column, right? And if you pay attention to the load path, what you see is that from the beam to the plate, it's bolts. But from the plate to the column, it's welds, okay? What you can't do is have both working together. Like you can't have a connection where if it was the beam connected to the plate, it was bolts and welds. Like you can't do that. It's got to be one or the other. Um, and that's that that isn't the case here because of the 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 that load path you know that hip bone connected to the leg bone uh, uh, thought process D does that make sense yes sir uh, just a curiosity question here but um what is is there a certain preference between bolts and welds like one's better of the other in certain situations and such um, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for that because it depends from situation to situation. Um, what I would say is when I look at this scenario, okay, so let's take a look at this scenario. This is a very common scenario of building construction, connecting a beam to a column, okay? There is a balancing act between convenience and economy, okay? For example, um, instead of using a plate here, I could use angles, all right? And and if I was using an angle, I could drill holes and everything and the whole thing could be bolted. So I could bolt the beam to the angle and the angle to the column, right? And that happens too. That is another common way of connecting beams to columns. The upside to that is there's no um, welding involved. I mean, on par, typically welding con it tends to be a bit more expensive than bolting. Okay, um, and, and because of the experience necessary, I mean, I I could teach any one of you all to install bolts on a structure, and, and you could be installing bolts in half an hour. It's not that hard. But welding is an art form. It takes years to to be a a, a master welder, and so that's one of the reasons why if you're welding really complex stuff, you can bring in a lot of money. Go talk to the folks that do welding on nuclear submarines and they certainly make more money than I do uh, for a reason. Um, but there's also a convenience factor. See, by welding that plate to the column, 
that's less stuff to have to deal with in the field. Just lift the beam in place, stick a few bolts in, you're done. So uh, it's, you know, the, there's a trade-off there. And where that trade-off resolves itself is in standard ways of connecting, you know, elements. And so one standard way is this, where you have like a, a tab welded to the column and the shop, and then you just bring the beam in. So it's like a combination of bolts and welds. It's convenient, but it's also not very uh, complicated. Um, so it's not about whether or not, you know, do you prefer one or the other? It's about using them where they make sense. That, that uh, I'd say would be the best answer. Uh, now, did I answer Mr. Shmierczynski's question as well? I'm going to take that as a yes, um, unless he said something, his mic's off. Would the bolts welds want to shear vertically? Um, well, yeah, I mean, they'd want to shear like that, yes. Uh, and would that change which bolts are considered interior versus exterior? That's a great question. So so think about what would happen, right? That, you know, there's a beam connected out here, you know, that's got all this, you know, load on it acting downward. So if I'm thinking about which way these bolts are going to rip through the plate, I would consider this as my edge bolt and this as my interior bolt. But here, here's the other thing to keep in mind. Like that's, that's what I would consider. But here's the other thing to keep in mind. If I'm a designer and I'm going to design this thing, I will design it symmetrically. In other words, I'm not going to make this dimension... I don't know, two inches and make this dimension, you know, five inches. I would never do that. I would just treat it symmetrically, right? Use symmetric dimensions so that as long as I know how many edge bolts there are and how many interior bolts there are, it doesn't really matter what side I consider one way or the other because the VRN is going to be the same. Does that make sense? Good deal. Okay, the other thing I want to bring up is this, is I want to talk about bolt bearing. We've been talking about the bolt bearing case with the plate, right? And you could do bolt bearing with the plate, but there's a whole other case with bolt bearing, and that's the beam, right? The beam is framing in. You know, if I um, if I look at this, you know, there's there's the um, let me make let me get a darker pin here. So here's the column, right? And so here's the plate sticking out, and we can do the bolt bearing case for the plate. But keep in mind that, you know, this this is connecting to a wide flange out here. And so the, the overall point I'm making is that in real life, there's always two cases with bolt bearing because a connection by its very nature is connecting one member to another. And so whenever you're investigating bolt bearing, there are two cases. We haven't had to worry about that in class and on the homework assignment that you did last time so far because the, the homework and the, the uh, examples in class were designed so that only one case mattered. On the homework, you were only given data about the channel, so you only needed to investigate the channel. And then in the example, there were two plates that were the same. It was the same member being connected. So you didn't have to worry about uh, uh, you know assessing one bolt bearing case and then another. But today I want to talk about that. Um, and, and I want to roll that into a discussion about a spliced connection. So I want to talk about a spliced connection and sort of the riddle of a spliced connection, uh, if you will. Now, before I dig into the spliced connection, I want to just off the side draw a, a tension member. Okay, so here's a tension member. And I let's put one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And I take that member and I yank on it in tension. Okay. Now I want everybody focusing on just this. Okay. Now, if I'm doing a bolted connection analysis, how many bolts do I consider in shear? We've actually already talked about this, you know, when we first introduced bolted connections. You do four, right? You're only looking one connection at a time. 
All right. And from a physics perspective, four of these bolts are focused on transferring load one way, but the other four are transferring load the other way. So when you're looking at each connect or at a tension member and you're looking at a connection, you only look at it, you know, one side at a time. So that's why if I was if I was looking at this tension member and I said what's the capacity under bolt shear, I take the capacity of a single bolt and multiply it by four, not by eight, because they're not operating in conjunction with one another. They're operating, you know, uh, to transfer load in different directions. So that um, that goes to a little bit of a riddle of, the, of a splice connection. So I've got here a splice connection. And so when I say splice, what we're talking about is joining a member together, right? So I've got, you know, this tension member and I'm trying to join it with this splice connection in the middle. Okay, so if you notice here, I've got, what is it? Uh, how many bolts do you see total here on the slide? I see one, two, three, four, uh, 20 over here and 20 over here. So there are a total of 40 bolts in this picture. But when I'm looking at bolt shear, I'm going to take the capacity of a single bolt and I'm going to multiply it by 20. Okay. Because whenever you're looking at a splice connection, you know, if I look at this plate in the middle, that plate in the middle is a tension member. And so I'm only going to look at half of it. So what I'm going to do is break out my secret weapon of structural engineering, the samurai sword or the lightsaber. And really all I'm interested in investigating is this. Here's a load and there's a load. And so there's always going to be two cases of bolt bearing, one being the main member. So I'll look at the bolt bearing capacity of that plate. And then I'll also look at the bolt bearing capacity of these. And so what I might do is compute the capacity of a single plate and then multiply it by two, or I might add up all the holes uh, and compute it all at once, however I want to do it. But the big thing to keep in mind is there's all the material transferring load one way, all the material transferring load the other way. So let's see if we can solve this riddle and let's see if we can make some conclusions about bolt shear. So first off, what are some conclusions I can make about bolt shear? Um, only consider, I guess, half the bolts. So for this example, is 20, not 40, okay? What else? Um, what is something else you can tell me about these bolts? And you should be able to see it by looking at the image. Boom. Double shear. More often than not, in spliced connections, bolts are in double shear. Okay, that's that's critical. Okay, what about conclusions of bolt bearing? Well, number one, cut splice down down the middle. That's what I'm talking about. See, see. so Mr. Roman said, so if you calculate uh, the capacity of one bolt, multiply by 20. By multiplying by 20, that is the strength of the connection. You only consider the one side. You don't, you don't multiply it by two again, no. That's, and that right there, that's the riddle. That's the whole point. It's like, you know, there's this... Um, you know, if if uh, if we're playing tug of war, and you're yanking on it with a hundred pounds, and I'm yanking on it with a hundred pounds, what's the tension in the, in the rope? The tension in the rope is not two hundred pounds. The tension in the rope is a hundred pounds. That's the idea. 
And so what you're saying is, you know, when you multiply it by two, you're you're falsely amplifying the connection or the, the capacity of the connection. Did that make sense? Did that cover what I was saying, Mr. Spiritchansky? It's really sort of focused on this. And so, yeah, so we're going to consider this. And two, evaluate both cases of bolt bearing. Okay. I think the, the easiest thing to do is to actually just, let's, let's get into an example because I, I have a full-blown example here. And we're going to try and, and rock through it pretty quickly. We may not get to layout requirements, but nothing changes with layout requirements. Just check S min and S max, check LE min and LE max, and see if it fits between the two. So there's nothing that's different there. So essentially, it's the force and the same on each side, uniform in the middle. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a way of putting it. Okay, so we got a half inch thick member spliced with two one quarter inch thick plates, seven eighths inch diameter, three uh, um, A325 bolts are used, all uh, steel is grade A36. I'm gonna show you how we would evaluate both cases of bolt bearing. Um, you're gonna see with this particular problem how they, they end up being the same, and I'll show you why, but then I wanna pull up the homework assignment and show you how that might not be the case. Uh, and, and I think you'll 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 piece that together when we uh, when we get through the work, because I kind of, my, my goal is for you to, once you see it and once you understand it, the homework will, will, uh, will be a breeze. So we got 7 8 inch uh, uh, A325 uh, diameter, uh, uh, 7 8 inch diameter A325 bolts. All the steel is grade A36. And we have a half inch thick member spliced with two quarter inch thick plates. And the, um, the case I'll make here in a bit is what if these thicknesses changed? Because for this particular problem, the thicknesses are kind of magical. And if the thickness is changed, then I think you'll see how it would it would throw things off a bit. So let me let me stop my share here. Once I get my mouse back. Where'd my mouse go. I got three monitors here and, and that that affects things. So So let me move this over and let me share this. <laughs> oh, I thought I'd copied my image over. Now I'm getting upset. I thought I had copied that over. There we go. Okay. So let's start off with bolt shear. Okay. So. Now, as I believe it was Mr. Riggs that pointed out, uh, it wasn't, I think it was Mr. Riggs and also Mr. Blizzard, um, when, we, uh, when we look at these bolts, what can we say? They are not in single shear, they're in double shear. And does everybody see that, that they're in double shear? Because there's two shear planes going through the bolts. Okay, so we got double shear. We were told the bolt diameter is a 7 eighths inch diameter. And we were told A325. That's all we know. So what do I do in order to determine the capacity of a single bolt? So first thing I'm going to do is open, you know, one of the most awesome you know, design aids, you know, which is table 7-1. So, you know, I'm going to, you know, the table 7-1 here. Um, that's the one that has all the, um, the capacities listed for uh, bolts and shear. And help me out, what, what am I gonna look up? So if I'm, you know, with this information, what do I look up? So I know A325, that's all I know.
Group A. That's right, because A325 is Group A and A490 is Group B. But then what? No. We, we assume N. If we don't know, we always assume the worst case. The worst case is that the threads are in the shear plane, not that they're not. So we're always going to assume the threads are included. Because that, because that, think, if you had a bolt and you were shearing through the threads, that would be the, the, the worst case scenario. So we have a uh, group A in, 7 8 inch diameter bolt, double shear. Um, what do we got per bolt? Somebody help me out. Uh, hold on. There we go. 48.7. So if you go to the table, all right, so I see where you read the 24.3, but look below that and then look over to the left. See where it says loading and it says S and D? S is for single shear and D is for double shear. So the 24.3 would be the capacity if the bolts were in single shear, but 48.7 is if they're in double shear. And so this is table 7-1. Now, now I'm going to take a sec. I, wanna, I don't want to just breeze through this. I want to make sure this is clear. So from the table, you, there's uh, two values listed for N and X. You said the double shear is the higher value or the lower value. Okay, hold on. We're, we're I think we're we're uh, mixing some things up. Give me one second. Um, it's a look at the loading section or the loading column, Logan. S S and D for single and double shear. So I'm sharing my screen here. Give me one second. So you should see you should see this. Okay, so go right here. So here's the table, right? So we're in group A, and so between N and X, we go threads included, and then over here we have single shear and double shear. So that's why I'm going with the double shear or the, deep, the lower value. No, that, that this, these are great questions. This, I mean, ask these questions if you got them. Don't, don't, don't hold back. Okay. All right. Now, here's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. How many bolts should we consider for, for the shear capacity of this connection? Oh, I, four, right? Hold on, where where'd my mouse go so I can pull my chat up? There we go. Yeah, four, because, you know, We've got one, two, three, four. And then the other side is just a mirror image, right? So the number of bolts is four. So therefore, phi R N, if it's 48.7 kips per bolt, and I got four bolts, 48.7 times four is 194, 194.8. Did I get that right? I just typed some numbers out. I didn't even really look. Three monitors and calculators. I'm just trying to make sure it's clear. Boom. All right. 
Does that make sense? Any questions before we talk a little bit about bolt bearing? Okay, I'm going to assume that that's good to go. Okay, so let me copy this because I'm lazy. Okay, let's talk about bolt bearing. Okay, so because we're not going to have time in class today to go through all the math, but I don't think that's all that necessary because really once you identify all the variables, everything else is, is pretty simple. Okay, so let's start off with some of the variables that are consistent. And usually whenever you're doing a bolt bearing computation, the one thing that is always consistent is your hole diameter. So uh, if we have a bolt diameter that is seven eighths of an inch, what is our hole diameter? Boom. Remember, we always add a sixteenth of an inch when we're doing the connection. Boom. Okay. Everybody good with that? All right. Now, I said that there was always two cases associated with bolt bearing. Okay. So we're going to go through one of them and then we'll look at the other and you'll kind of see, see what's going on here. But what I want to do first is I want to illustrate the equations that we're using. Okay. So we compute the capacity. Sorry. We compute the capacity of a single bolt as the minimum of what? So it's 1.2 LC thickness times FU and 2.4 DBT FU, right? And so we compute the uh, LCE, the edge distance one, by taking the edge distance plus, or sorry, not plus, minus, minus half of a hole diameter and we compute, man, I'm getting ahead of myself. We compute the interior edge distance by taking the bolt spacing minus a full hole diameter. Like those are our equations, right? That's our, that's our, our model that we're following. Everybody with me so far? So, Let's see if we can think this through. Okay, so therefore, like what parameters affect, like what raw input parameters, so it's going to, maybe we get into system parameter land, uh, what raw parameters affect the capacity of a plate in bolt bearing? Well, it's the plate thickness, the bolt spacing, the edge distance, the FU right? Everything else is computed from those, right? Now the bolt diameter affects it as well, but the bolt diameter is going to be the same for all of them. Like the bolt diameter for the splice plate is not going to be different than the bolt diameter through the main plate because it's all the same bolt, right? So these right here are the key parameters. with me so far. Now, by the way, for this connection, if we agree that there are four bolts, how many edge bolts, how many interior bolts? Two and two. So, I'll put that out here because that's not going to change. S 
Uh, no, but I guess the only other thing that's worth mentioning is maybe if you had a staggered connection, you got to just be careful that the L, because if it's staggered, then you're going to have different LCE values for different bolts. But I'm not going to do that to you, so don't worry about that. Like if, just to make the point, if this was your member, right, and you're yanking on it, and you had this, 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 this. You've got this LCE, this LCE, but this LCE is different. Because it, it where it's staggered, it's further in. With me so far? All right, here's the point I'm making. So let's look at the main plate and let's look at the splice plates. Let's start off with the main plate. The thickness of the main plate is a half inch, right? Okay. The FU is 58 KSI. Right? It's 58 KSI because it's A36. The problem in the beginning said that all the plates in this problem were A36. Okay? So, um, the only thing we need are the bolt spacings and the edge distance. What's the bolt spacing for this problem? Two. It's two. In, well, I, I see what you're saying. It's, it's actually, at, and I admit it's hard to read, but... Um, it's two and three quarters, so but you're 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 right. Two point seven five inches and one point five inches. Okay. Now be clear, be clear, you said L C E. L C E is a computed value. Okay. This isn't L C E, this is L E. Make sure you're clear on that. Because what we would do with these values is we would compute LCE and LCI and then take that and compute RN and take that and compute VRN. Does that make sense? Okay, now here's the kicker. Let's look at this this, this, and this. Okay, so what do we know that's consistent? Well, we know this is 58 KSI because this is also A36. So one question I have for you just as a thought experiment, what if the splice plates were made of a different grade of steel? What that would mean is that you'd have to do this calculation all over again. You'd have to compute LC or, you know, your, your RN for your main plate and then your RN for your splice plate, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Now, what about the bolt spacing? The bolt spacing is the same. That's 2.75. The edge distance, the edge distance is 1.5 inches. But here's the kicker. This is what I want you to think about. What is the thickness of the splice plate? And to be clear, when we do this, we have, you know, case one, and then we have case two. All the plates trans. So what is the thickness of the splice plates? This, this is probably the last question I'll, I'll ask you before we're done. Well, it's a quarter, but, now here's the kicker, but is it just one plate? There you go, it's two. Times a quarter. Does that make sense? Because there's two plates transferring load the other direction. There's two splice plates. So just treat them as one big old plate with two edge bolts and two interior bolts. So if you look at these two cases, 
They happen to be identical, right? But the kicker is, what if they weren't? Unfortunately, you'd have to do what you did on your homework assignment. You just have to do it twice. One bolt bearing case for the main plate, one bolt bearing case for the splice plate. Everything that we did on the homework assignment, you just do it twice. And I know you're not going to like me, but that's exactly what we're going to do on your homework assignment coming up. I'm going to stop this share real quick. I want to show you that homework assignment. I know we're running short on time, so I'll be quick. But I want to show you what's going on on that homework assignment. So here's the, the thing. Let me share it. So here's the member that we're assessing on the homework. And so instead of a plate connecting to another plate, it's a wide flange connecting to a plate. Now that doesn't change the complexity. The only thing to keep in mind is, you know, the splice, we can see that each splice plate is three quarters of an inch thick. What about the thickness of the flange of a W16 by 77? It's not going to be three quarters. It's going to be point whatever. It's going to be, you know, a decimal value. So we've got to, you know, pull that thickness from, from the uh, manual. The one thing I'll tell you about this homework assignment is this homework assignment is in no way, shape, or form any more difficult than the homework assignment that you did last time. The only thing to keep in mind is just be real careful how many bolts you're counting because, you know, each splice plate might have, you know, eight bolts to consider, but there's a splice plate up top and a splice plate down the bottom. So just be careful, think through the problem. This is this is a homework assignment that's not really difficult from a mathematics perspective. You just got to make sure that you're not double counting something. Um, the only other thing I'll tell you to help you out is that Regardless of what case of bolt bearing that you check out, if you get some high values, that's okay. This is an exercise to see whether or not you're computing the values correctly and whether or not you understand what you're doing. The, I'll go ahead and tell you, the bolt bearing capacity is higher than bolt shear. So don't be worried if you get like a value that's 200 kips versus a value that's like seven or 800 kips. I don't remember the exact number, but, but that's okay. Um, just go through the cases correctly. I want you to check both cases of bolt bearing because uh, I want to make sure that you understand how to compute it correctly. Any quick questions before we call it? So you're basically just taking what we did on last homework and just do it, doing it again and basically just checking two different cases of, uh, of bolt bearing. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, this homework might be a tad challenging, so if you have any questions, let me know. I'll try and respond on Teams, and we will – we know we didn't finish. We didn't have time, so you're going to have to go through and do the, the, the bolt bearing check on the, um, on, the, uh, uh, on the assignment. I may post a short video going through the, the – um, um, I – no, but what I'll do is is we're, we've got people leaving. So what I'll do is um, uh, just uh, I'll post a short video uh, on the YouTube channel that where I'll finish this. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording and we will see you all on uh, on Friday.